Do you want the easy retraction of a direct drive, but the high speed of a Bowden tube? Achieve both with the Flex 3 Drive Extruder. This is my Seket SK Go. It's currently my favorite printer, and that's because it's the printer that gives me the best print quality out of the couple of dozen that I've tested. It came with clones of the Bontech BMG and E3D V6, and it's responsible for printing the best Benchy that I've ever had. But I wanted to see if I can improve on my results even further by fitting a remote drive flex cable extruder. As you'll see at the end, the results were pretty interesting. So I'll start with an overview of what we're trying to achieve, look at the product, and then do a step-by-step -step guide for installation. We generally have two configurations for 3D printers and the difference between them is whether there's a Bowden tube in between the extruder and the hot end. Let's have a look at each. On a Bowden tube setup, the heavy stepper and the drive gear is mounted remotely and the filament is pushed through the Bowden tube down to the hot end. On a direct drive setup, the stepper motor and hopped gear sits directly above the hot end and pushes the filament down to be extruded. The thing about it is one is not automatically better than the other, they both have strengths and weaknesses. With a Bowden tube setup, the print head doesn't have to carry around heavy stepper motors. Therefore, it has a much higher theoretical top speed for printing without introducing artifacts. The surfaces of your prints should be clean and without ringing or ghosting. The downside is that all of that length between the extruder and hot end makes it not impossible, but harder to dial in retraction and stringing is more prevalent. Direct drive is the opposite. Retraction is easy to dial in, so torture tests like chainmail with lots of tiny retractions print really cleanly. The print head, however, is carting around the additional weight of the extruder stepper motor, which means compared to a Bowden tube setup, as we print faster and faster, we're going to introduce ringing or ghosting as seen on the side of this low poly Pokemon. So there are strengths and weaknesses for Bowden tube and direct drive, but what if we could come up with a compromise that took only the positives of each? That's where remote flex drive extruders come in. The extruder stepper motor is mounted remotely, just like on a Bowden tube, but instead of driving a hobbed gear that grips the filament, it instead drives a flex cable, and the other end of that drives the hobbed gears directly above the hot end, like on a direct drive extruder. What this should mean is the control of a direct drive with the lightweight head of a Bowden tube. And the flex drive extruder that I'm featuring in this video is the Flex 3 Drive G5. The features that really drew me to it was the fact that it was open source, so I figured it was going to be easy to design my own adapters if need be. It's very compact and light overall. And there are other options that I can explore, such as feeding a tiny NEMA 8 stepper motor, if that's the way I want to go. One thing that I really liked was the fact that I could choose a bare bones kit and then print my own parts to save money. This hardware kit cost me £45 and about half that much in postage to get it to Australia. The length that I went for on the SK Go was 800. If you don't want to print your own parts, there's various options in the shop. To have the kit shipped to you, printed with either FDM, SLA resin, or SLS nylon. You can also buy the individual parts if you want to do some tinkering. And for some printers, such as the Ultimaker 2, you can buy an entire kit to make it a bolt-on affair. The website is currently being rebuilt, so there are some gaps in documentation, but what is there is very good. Documentation includes a technical overview explaining the concept of the product and then we have this step-by-step -step section on assembly. It goes through printing the parts, assembling the lay shaft, assembling the housing, coupling the flex shaft to the motor, specs for matching an ideal stepper motor and guides for setting up the firmware for three types of firmware including Marlin. Step one is printing the parts and this downloads page is a new and welcome addition at the time of recording. Everything is categorized with STLs, and in a lot of cases, there's also STP files, so you can modify and make your own parts if need be. With all of these files, knowing what you need can be overwhelming. The first essential set are the housing parts, and I resin printed mine on the Piopoli Moai at 0.1mm layer height in tough resin. There are resin and FDM parts available, with different tolerances for each, so make sure you download the right set of files. I printed a set of each for comparison's sake, with the SLS parts coming in at 10 grams. My FDM parts were printed in ABS, 
and were a negligible 2 grams lighter. Therefore, I ended up sticking with the high quality resin printed parts. The next essential parts are a motor cap and coupler. The weight of these is irrelevant, but I stuck with the SLS parts because they look so nice and smooth. If your printer was direct drive, you're going to need a new way to mount it on the frame. You can either print this part, or in my case, a spare bracket came with the SK Go, so I used that instead. The last essential part may be the trickiest, depending on your printer. And this is the adapter to fit the extruder to the hot end. For many popular printers, you'll find a solution already there on the website. In my case, I measured up and adapted my design to match the mounting position of the factory Bontech clone. These files are available for download in the description. With our parts printed, we can move on to the assembly. We're going to start with the lay shaft, and the first job is to put this metal part through the cog. It's a pretty tight fit, but I found very light taps with a rubber mallet were able to increment it up the shaft. Here I am applying lubricant, mistakenly thinking it was glue. Make sure you leave this step out. It's a really snug fit, so I'm not worried about anything slipping later on. After a series of additional love taps, everything was in place and my first component was assembled. Realizing my error, I then cleaned off the excess lubricant and that meant I was ready to slide the hobbed gear onto the shaft as well. It's secured with a single grub screw that you want to be as tight as possible without stripping the thread. Finally, there's a bearing that goes on each side. Once again, these were pretty tight fit, so I used my mallet to tap them into position. The second side was exactly the same. Place, tap, and then our lay shaft assembly is complete. This won't be necessary for resin printed parts, but if you're printing in FDM, the first step in the housing assembly is to take a drill bit and clean out each of the holes. One pair of holes needs a smaller drill bit than the others, so pay close attention to the instructions. Both the upper and lower portions of the housing both accept a bearing in the inner corners. These are a satisfyingly tight fit and I used a large hex bit to press them into position. We can now take our lay shaft sub-assembly, rest it in position in the lower housing and make sure it turns without failing on anything. Now is a good time to use the included lube to apply a thin and consistent coat to the cog. We can now take the worm gear and pointy side facing down, insert it into the lower housing. The upper housing then goes over the top and I found it to be once again a satisfyingly snug fit. With everything together, you can gently turn the worm gear to ensure everything is moving freely. The next part we need is the cap and it sits on top as you might expect. There's three M2.5 bolts that go through to align everything and once they're the whole way in, you can put on the matching nuts to temporarily hold everything together. The next part to install are the arms and you'll notice there's two, one with one dot and one with two dots. If I align them directly on top of each other, Watch the inner section. As I turn one on and off, you can see that there's a slight tolerance difference that relates to how tightly they grip the filament. The version with the two dots being the tighter one for use with flexible filament. The last of our bearings goes onto a very short metal shaft and we want to get the bearing centered on the shaft. This shaft and bearing simply clips into place inside the tension arm. After that, it wiggles into place Two holes align in the lower housing and a small black bolt retains it. A note on the tension arm when printed with FDM, this is the smallest and most difficult part to print and you can expect to do a little bit of fine tuning to get everything to sit nicely and achieve correct alignment on the final assembly. Something I'd seen on CNC kitchen videos but never done before myself was to melt in threaded inserts. Both M3 and M2.5 mm versions come with the kit and in this case, we need the smaller M2.5. With the soldering iron set to 300 degrees, I aligned everything by hand and then gently pushed it home into place. This part of the process was immensely satisfying. And once you have all three in place, you can take off the temporary nuts from the lower housing and screw them into the adapter part to make sure that everything is aligned correctly. It was around this time I acknowledged just how terrible my prints were for these FDM parts and reassembled using the resin parts instead. We're now ready to fit the extruder to our 3D printer and on the second SK Go that comes with a clone Bontec BMG and E3D V6, this is really straightforward. We simply have to take out bolts that we can see until the parts come loose and we can pull the two plates apart and remove the pancake stepper. Minus this stepper, 
the X carriage bolts together in exactly the same way. And as you tighten the four corner bolts, the precision machined parts slot back together perfectly. Before you continue, you'll need to cut a 41 millimeter length of PTFE tube to interface between the new adapter and the V6 hot end. Before putting everything back together, I took the time to weigh the old and new parts for comparison. I was delighted to find that the parts that are moved around were 161 grams lighter. My adapter piece aligns with the holes left behind by the stepper motor. M3 by 12 millimeter bolts go through and then you can use lock nuts on the rear to secure everything into place except the lower right hole which we can't torque until the hot end is in place. The retaining cap can then come off and the groove mount of the E3D V6 slots nicely into place. This cap is now held in place by two bolts, on the left an M3 by 20 and on the right an M3 by 35 held in place with a lock nut at the rear like the other corners. The heatsink cooling fan for the V6 can now snap back into place and our 41mm pre-prepared length of PTFE tube can slide down into the bore. Finally our G5 is inserted from the top and the three M3 by 2.5 bolts torque down tightly. In terms of the hot end side our assembly is now complete. We can take the flex shaft and locate the round end with the flat and then look down the barrel of our extruder, align the flat and push down and wiggle until it seats into place. There's a small nut and bolt that then fastens together to retain the sheathing inside the upper cap. I now had the unenviable job of unwrapping my cable spiral wrap to separate the wiring that used to go to the pancake stepper motor. With this cable now free, I can now do the whole process in reverse to wrap it all back up. It is really tidy at least. Now to mount the extruder stepper motor remotely. I chose a location on the upper rear frame of the printer right next to the wiring loom I had just modified. The stepper motor will come up from underneath and then the motor cap from the top to hold everything together. But first we need to thread our motor cap over the other end of the flex shaft and install the printed coupler. Here was the only problem I faced however because the included bolts were too long and fouled on the motor cap. I didn't have any spares in the correct size so I used a Dremel tool instead to trim them down to size. I cleaned up the end of the cut with a small file and if you ever have to do this you always do it with a nut in place because as you unscrew it it'll clean up the thread. The round end of the coupler goes over the output shaft of the extruder stepper motor and is tensioned with the nut and bolt. We now insert the motor and coupler through the bottom of the motor mount and insert the square end of the shaft into the other end of the coupler. Once again we tighten the nut and bolt to secure everything in place. Four short M3 bolts now go in the corner to hold the stepper motor to the motor cap. Now's an excellent time to make sure that everything clears on the inside. We don't want any self-destruction the first time that we print. Assuming it's clear, you can plug back in the stepper motor connector and then use the remaining nut and bolt to do up the motor cap. Our physical installation is now complete. Loading up filament is now really easy. We simply open the little arm That'll expose the pathway through to the hot end and once the filament's in place, we close it and it locks into position. There are some firmware changes and I can't cover them in the way I normally would because they're specific for each machine. It wasn't necessary for me to invert the direction of my stepper motor, but I did need to reduce the amount of micro stepping down from 16 to 4 to suit my TMC2130 stepper motor drivers. I also dropped the stepper motor current for the extruder down to 400 as instructed. The rest of the firmware changes are just settings and you don't need to recompile the firmware for them. Instead, you can change them from the printer's LCD or via a serial connection with Octoprint or Prontoface. I plugged in a Big Tree Tech TFT35 and used the terminal function to enter the G code from the instructions one line at a time. After this, I calibrated my E steps and found I needed to adjust from the baseline of 950 steps per millimeter up to 1045. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, in the description below is linked a dedicated video to this process. The other thing that I decided to do was to recalibrate my linear advance K factor. After three iterations narrowing down, I found the K factor was pretty much the same as before. Our final setup concerns the slicer with recommended retraction of 1.5 millimeters at a speed of 15 millimeters per second. It's also recommended to reset any extrusion multipliers back to one or 100%. 
Okay, onto some before and after printing tests. I had four different tests, but unfortunately, two of them were rendered useless. I attempted to print this 20mm calibration cube at 200mm per second, as well as a 3D Menchi, also at 200mm per second. You may remember from my review of this printer, I had a little mishap that was completely my fault. Since then, the part cooling fan duct is still broken and the fan doesn't really fit properly. This subpart cooling, combined with a really fast print speed, means the nozzle spends a lot of time in the one place, the plastic doesn't really cool down and turns to mush. Therefore, my before and after calibration cubes were junk, as were my before and after benchies. I did design this speed test part that did work well, and you're probably thinking it's going to waste heaps of filament, but I chose to run it hollow, with the speed increasing from 60mm per second up to 200mm per second by the top. Your slicer will slow down outer perimeters, but the inner perimeters are still at the intended speed. My first test print with the G5 ended prematurely because of a filament strip. This was with the one dot tensioning arm, so I switched to the two dot tensioning arm and tried again. This time it was successful, and I can't really tell the difference between the two. The motion system on this printer is so good that it has little to no ringing from factory. My final test was a hollow, low poly Fox using the most flexible TPU I have, Filiflex. This one was printed at 60 millimeters per second, and this is a test that I conducted previously on the E3D Hermera. Both of these prints would still benefit from some tuning of retraction, but it's really impressive how well both extruders negotiated this very soft filament at relatively high speed. My testing results with this extruder are a reminder that with 3D printing, it's much more complicated than simply getting the motion system perfect. In this case, a suboptimal part cooling fan setup was the limiting factor. But that's not to say this product was a waste of time. What I should have done is fitted it to a printer that suffered from more mechanical artifacts like ringing or ghosting. Some top candidates would have been the Artillery 3D X1, which suffers from mild ghosting, or the Cetus Mark III that suffers from quite prominent ghosting. If you've got a Bowden tube printer and you struggle with retraction but want to retain high speed, this kit might be for you. Also, if you have a direct drive printer that suffers from ringing, then this kit also might be for you. This extruder is on generation 5 now, and it feels like it too. The design feels very refined and well engineered. My only complaints were two things. Two of the bolts being too long for the coupler, and the download section not being in place when I printed my parts. But that gives me a chance to thank all the people in the community, as well as the creator of this product, for helping me out and giving me files as I needed them. Have you got any thoughts on this installation or what it can do for your printer? If so, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.